Let's talk about crossovers. First of all, a crossover is the point where the slopes meet and hand off to another driver. So, the need for a crossover. Well, every driver is capable of producing uh, with a sound within a range that is designed into it by the manufacturer. Uh, in the times before time, which is when I was a young man, um, most of the time, inexpensive uh, speaker sets were um, a single driver was used, and uh, they would just uh, make that one driver try to play everything. And uh, the manufacturer would, of the stereo for that, uh, that, that played to that driver, the amplifier would have a cutoff point at a certain point in the lower spectrum uh, to where the stereo wouldn't output any sound below a certain frequency so that the driver that they were accompanying that stereo with uh, would be able to handle what was being output to it. And of course the other control was you turning the volume down whenever you were playing something that was distorting the speaker. <laughs> Since then our technology has improved quite a bit. Also, the complications surrounding that technology have grown quite a bit. So, the crossover point has become more of a crucial thing. And now we have uh, a speaker assembly with multiple drivers in it. Uh, this may be in a car or a home at, or in a movie theater. It doesn't matter. The same principles will always apply across the board. Uh, so if you have two drivers in there, you'll have two overlapping slopes. So let's say, for example, you've only got a set of bookshelf speakers or a two-way setup with no subwoofers or nothing. Your woofer in that scenario or your low-range driver is going to play all the information from 20 hertz up to, say, you know, uh, 3,000, 4,000 hertz. And then the tweeter is going to pick up at that 4,000 hertz mark and play everything up to 20,000 hertz. And the point to where the woofer stops playing and the point where the tweeter starts playing is the crossover point. And the uh, slope of the crossover is the uh, uh, slope is how quickly the gain or volume goes up or down uh, for that channel so if you uh, you don't want to have it just immediately stop right so as you get to 80 Hertz where you have your low pass filter um, you're gonna want to start turning the power down turning the volume down or the gain down and the slope is how fast you turn that knob down as that sound is slowly getting lower and lower and lower. So if you think of it like this, if the tone is going, and then you're seeing it getting uh, right when you get to 80 hertz, you know, and then you start turning the volume down, and is it steadily dropping, and the volume's going down? That's how. That's the slope. Okay, as it drops. And a real fast slope is just going to drop quickly. And a real slow slope is going to drop real slowly. And the distance that that takes is the per octave or dB per octave. What that means is uh, how many dBs, how many decibels are you reducing okay, per octave of drop or uh, or you know, up or down drop. And an octave is a measurement of the tone from this frequency to this frequency. And then the decibels is a measurement of the volume or the gain. So if you're lo it's like if you're losing uh, 12 dB per octave, over one octave from C to C or from E to E on a piano scale, over that one octave, you are dropping 12 decibels. 
and that'll create two points on a graph that you can see because here you were at this many decibels and here you're at this many decibels you know you've lost 12 decibels and there's only one octave different from 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 this low c to this high c so that's db per octave and uh, that's how you measure those two points now how you connect those two points is where you get into the shape um, uh, and that's the curve the shape of the up or down slope so if you're using a Linquence Riley for example it might be a curve like this if you're using a uh, you know, butters for butterworth it might be a curve that looks more like a half a part of a circle whereas one may look more like a straight line and one may look more like a little curve and then more of a straight line each of these curves has a name and they're all important uh, so when once you understand where you're crossing over and how much of a slope you're going to put on that crossover then or on that you know that filter then you have to determine what happens when this driver is still playing some and this driver here is still playing some but not the full signal what's happening in the middle okay because what you want to output is a flat signal you want the amplitude to remain relatively the same as these drivers drop off and in certain situations when you have both of them still being active at a certain point you may wind up with a bump so whenever you're at a certain frequency you listen to the music you'll hear a certain frequency is louder because now there's two drivers reproducing that same sound and uh, when that happens the music sounds wrong <clears throat> so you have to understand how those how those interact with each other and if you don't want to get too much in the weeds on uh, understanding how those uh, those two slopes will interact with each other a basic rule of thumb is a 24 db slope on a Linquence Riley crossover that's going to usually give you the net result will give you a relatively flat crossover point and so it was the handoff point where you're handing off from one driver to the other uh, so if you don't want to go any further and, and start really getting deep into this which is an extremely extremely deep rabbit hole uh, just just set things to 24 db per octave on liquid Riley, and you're going to be almost always going to be really close that's a good go-to uh, crossover point for subs mids it doesn't matter the whole thing um the community agrees that that's usually a pretty good point however uh there are about a million nuances that can affect that so if you're wanting to be absolutely uh the best you can possibly be you're going to need to invest in some equipment to be able to measure the responses from your particular setup and your car or house or movie theaters gain the room gain or the cabin gain uh, is going to greatly affect what what stuff gets ampli amplified the amplitude of of the entire spectrum of sound having uh, a little piece of equipment called rew or room eq wizard uh, is a huge boon in this department because it doesn't measure the sound coming out of the device it measures the perceived sound once it's in the space therefore you can uh, take the room or the space into consideration when setting those crossover points and many other things uh, so <clears throat> now we've established what a crossover is and why it's necessary uh, good crossover points well if you want to start by um, uh, you want to start by knowing what first of all what your equipment uh, is capable of doing and um, that's the, the best place to go so 
you want to check with your manufacturer uh, the information in the manual or on their website and you want to look for the crossover points recommended for the driver it's usually uh, attached to or alongside the RMS power handling of the driver because usually the RMS power handling of the driver is dependent on where it's being crossed over at so you may be able to you run a hundred watts RMS through this mid-range driver when you're crossing it over uh, the low crossover point at like you know uh, 300 Hertz and uh, um, and you may have to reduce it a lot more than that you know if you were going to cross it over at 200 Hertz um, so and then they'll also list a slope as well because if you're crossing it over at 300 Hertz for 100 watts with a 24 dB slope well, if you wanted to go down to a lower point, like say 250 hertz, you might be crossing it over at like a 36 dB slope or a 48 dB slope. Because essentially what you're doing is instead of having this line, you're going to have this line. But this end point, you see, will stay the same. So here's a 48 dB slope and here's a 24 dB slope. So you're crossing it over. You're starting the roll off at a higher point, but you're ending it about the same place and the idea is you don't want that driver to play information below that point no matter how you uh, you set it up you want the end result to be zero you know low low information being played at the same point um, so you have to pick your drivers based on those characteristics now if you're putting together a three-way set out of the blue out of the sky of the wild <laughs> uh, you're going to want to make sure that they're capable of playing uh, uh, capable of being crossed over at the same point so if you've got a you're picking out a mid-range driver that can play up to 4,000 Hertz you want to make sure that the tweeter that you pick to go with that can play at 4,000 Hertz or below uh, so that they, these two can, can meet up with each other. And they're also going to need a similar uh, linearity in their, their volume, their decibel increase as they go up. And for that, I would suggest just looking at the efficiency of those two drivers. You know, the efficiency needs to be similar. Uh, that way you're not going to have a tweeter that gets much louder as the volume goes up the power to it goes up, uh, you know, and, and, or, or vice versa. You want them to elevate, escalate together. <laughs> and the efficiencies, <clears throat> there's a lot of different things you can look at, but you're going to get, again, the weeds get deep. So look at the efficiency on them and see if they, uh, you know, the power handling and the efficiency. And it kind of gives you a good general idea of um, how to match those up of course the easiest way is just to buy combo sets to buy something that's literally set up to play with something else but if you're wanting to be creative and inventive and independent you know then you're going to have to uh, either take some chances and hope that they work well together or do a whole lot of learning uh, so that you can educate yourself and and then hope that the manufacturer includes the you know the documentation you need to make those decisions and then of course once you get the equipment you can use something like re rew to find out if you've made good choices or not <laughs> and uh and once you've done that and you've got the equipment to adjust your crossover points and your slopes then you can learn whether you know whether or not you've made good adjustments and you know according to that space so Anyway, I hope this was helpful, guys.